Hey, Deshima Tiji and Kubala, that's very nice of you to take time out uh, of your very busy schedule um, and um, share with us your glorious times with Srimanta Ji. Could you please um, tell us where it was first when you met Srimanta Ji and how it was for you? Uh, you've been a seeker for a while, um, for a very long time before that previously. Uh, possibly. So could you please tell us all about it? Yes. So um, I consciously began seeking at about 14 years old. And uh, I think many people think about what's the purpose of life and so on. And I have no idea how that happened. It uh, actually had a very comfortable upbringing with loving parents and so on, which uh, sadly is not often the case in America. And um, it was just some sort of strong desire. And um, as I got a little older, which is by about the next year, I was talking to my dad about it. And he was like, what? what? You know, I wanted something called enlightenment. Parents were very concerned uh, because they thought, you know, you're supposed to be a student and go get a good career. So eventually they persuaded me. I actually wanted to find a guru, by the way. You know, I'd read about such things in some of the books on my dad's shelf. I thought if I find a guru in India, I'll get enlightenment. So anyway, the agreement was I complete my studies and then I can go find a spiritual teacher. So um, I went on to university and so on, but I'll fast forward to how I found mother. Um, so in 1976, um, I was at university and I was um, doing my usual, which was meditating either in Charnwood Forest, which was a forest near the university, or, you know, just sitting under a tree or lying on a branch. And this particular evening, I was lying on a branch and I saw that the sun was setting and I thought, well, I better head back uh, to my flat. And I got down from the tree and I started walking. And all of a sudden, this, this tremendous rush occurred up my back and straight out of my head. Now, this was instant, but my memory is sort of slow, you know, happening in slow motion. And I just went into this state of complete joy. I was laughing and bubbling like a little child and practically floated across the field uh, towards the sunset. And this lasted for about a day through the night and the next morning as well. And that was uh, 1976. And at that time, I didn't know the date was special until I met uh, mother uh, the following year. Uh, the date was the 5th of May, 1976. So the following year after I met mother in 77, I found out that uh, she had given me realization by remote control. Uh, I have to admit that uh, I, uh, I didn't think it was realization because to me, uh, self-realization meant you have this wonderful experience where you realize you are no longer the body, you're no longer the mind, you're no longer the emotions. Uh, but as you know, in Sahaj, when the Kundalini is raised, uh, we call it realization, especially when it comes out through Sasrara. Uh, so that was the term she used. So I met her in 77, uh, obviously through her magical workings and my desire, uh, by going to a friend's house who was living in London at the time. And um, he was also a seeker. And he told me about a magazine called Time Out. And he said to me, hey, Bala, uh, there are lots of gurus in the back of the magazine, save you a trip to India, or some, some words to that effect. And I remember laughing and I said, oh, come on. I said, no, no real guru will advertise in, in the back of a magazine. I mean, it just sounds so <laughs> absurd. Anyway, he went off to work and I had nothing to do in this tiny room. Uh, so I looked at the back of the magazine and 
surely there were lots of gurus advertising everything and they were charging money even some for a, a fast track uh, enlightenment or self-realization and then i saw this tiny ad which i found out later was the first ad mother had asked them to put out and it simply said uh, self-realization this is your divine birthright no money will be taken and underneath it said nirmala devi and you know it gave the time and so on so on that day i uh, I went to the place Caxton Hall for the meeting. In fact, in my diary, I still have the, the note that says 6 p.m. Caxton Hall, Nirmala Devi, which is how I remember a lot of the details because I kept a diary at that time and you know, after, after Sahaj as well. So at Caxton Hall, um, mother used to come uh, wearing mostly, I've seen uh, white saris with a hair open, um, a very um, a very grand persona, but very unlike the guru that we have in our attention with, you know, saffron clad or something like that with long locks and stuff like that. So what was it like for you? <laughs> Yes, I was expecting uh, enlightened soul, you know, with glowing eyes or glittering eyes, long beard, male, of course, very quiet, hardly spoke a word until, unless he gave instructions and who would hit me if I made a mistake, perhaps, or tell me off. And so I walked into this hall and uh, there was an Indian lady sitting on the stage in a white sari. Um, and on either side of her was some very, uh, I don't know how to put it politely, but they looked unwell to me, that's all I can say. But they also, in my opinion, were hippies, because I'd met a lot of hippies during my seeking years, and they were all quite nice people. And uh, there was a chap talking at the microphone, standing up and speaking. Uh, he he was older than the other people who were sitting uh, on the stage, uh, the young people on either side of uh, the lady. Uh, so I sat near the door on the right hand side of the stage because firstly, it didn't uh, match my image uh, you know, that I had in my mind. And I thought if it's not very good, I can slip out the door at any time. Uh, so I sat there and uh, within about 10 minutes, it was getting boring because uh, this chap who was speaking uh, kept going on. And I think he was trying to introduce us to Mataji and talking about some of the stuff, which was all, because uh, I didn't know about all this Kundalini business and chakras and all that, because what I read were the Vedas and the Upanishads and uh, you know a lot of philosophy books. So I thought that what I would have would be like this spontaneous enlightenment. Um, so the moment I thought of leaving, and um, it was uh, a signal going to your legs, and I started to get up, and mother suddenly spoke and stopped this guy, and he said, uh, she said, Gavin, I'll speak now. And uh, I remained seated. And she basically interrupted him in mid-sentence. So then Marshi came up and I was also surprised to see she was very small, you know, compared to him because he had to lower the microphone. And it's just all these things you remember, you know, later. Um, and uh, then she started speaking and that to me was great because it was as though she was addressing everything I had thought about regarding my seeking, I mean, and uh, was answering some of them. Uh, again, this is all on a mental level, of course. And um, I thought, oh, this, this seems pretty good. And then at the end, she said um, something to the effect that you don't have to, you know, practice for years or go to a guru or whatever. Uh, you can have it right now. And part of me was skeptical, but part was really excited, like, really, you know, you can have it now. So she asked us to stay back. She said, those who want it can stay back. 
So about 10 people left and about 20 stayed back. And she asked us to move to the left side of the hall. So I, I moved with the group and I sat in the back row. You know, I just didn't want to be where the action was, so to speak. Um, so I sat in the back row and then she came down and she brought a couple of the people who were on stage with her. Uh, they were accompanying her. And you probably know in those days, she did all the working on people. Uh, the yogis, uh, as I call them now, didn't do anything. They just hung around. And um, she was waving her hands at the first person on the front row. And then she looked up and uh, looked at me. And I was sitting in the back row. There are probably about four or five rows. And uh, she said, he's got it. She's got it. And uh, she turned to the person next to her and said, he's got it. He's got it. And I thought, you know what? I haven't got anything. I mean, I'm just sitting here watching you. And uh, eventually she came around to my row and she came straight up to me and said, you've got, got it. You? No, first she spoke in Hindi. And I thought, hey, if this is a guru, you know, enlightened, they should know I can't speak Hindi. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I can't speak any Indian language. And um, so she, she then asked in English, you know, do you feel it? And I said, no. Then she put a hand over my head and I thought, what's going on? So, so I, I was looking up. Yeah. And I noticed she was holding a hand like really high. So, you know, somewhere up here, she's standing in front of me. And she again turned to the person or persons next to her and said, he's got it, he's got it. And then she said, do you feel a cool breeze? <laughs> of course, I felt nothing, no breeze, cool, warm, you know, nothing. And um, then the person on my right got all excited and started going, um, I feel it, I feel it. And I thought, oh, you know, power of suggestion. Then the person <laughs> on my left started going, and he was waving his hands like, whoa, I feel it. And I thought, okay, mass hypnosis, you know, because <laughs> you, you know, these things can happen. And I absolutely, thought mass hypnosis. Absolutely. And, and, and mother wandered off and um, that was it. And then the meeting was over and I went back and uh, to my flat and I was kind of disappointed. I thought, ah, well, India, here I come. And um, I don't know if it was that night or a night later or so, as I was lying in bed, I began to feel this pressure in my chest. And I thought, what in the world is this? Uh, so I thought, um, I'd go out for a walk. So in England, it's a bit <laughs> cold in autumn. Yeah. So got my coat and all that and went out for a walk. And then this thought just came out completely out of the blue. Uh, it, it said, that lady caused this and she will have to cure it. And there was no logic to it. And I just reached into my pocket. And this it was guy, a thought. Asked, uh, yeah, what's that? It was a thought. It was a thought. It was, yeah. it was, yeah, a thought. Yeah. I guess it yeah. was a thought, but it was. I get it. Somebody telling me that. I have no idea. Basically, yeah. it was my own brain saying she yeah. caused it and she has to cure it. Yes. So I remember that this chap, Gavin, had given. You know, those days they weren't organized. So he had ripped a little bit of paper off the edge of a newspaper and written a phone number down. I, so I pulled that out of my coat pocket. Thank goodness it was the same coat I was wearing. I probably had only one. And I went to a call box and called that number. It was quite late at night, but he answered. And uh, he told me, you know, where they have follow-up meetings and so on. So um, I took note of that and uh, decided to go for that follow-up. And at this point, you were a student still or did you start work already? Uh, at that time, I, I oh, hold on. At that time, um, I had finished my studies. Yeah, okay. I finished my studies. Okay. I was on my way to India, basically. Okay, uh, yes, you were looking for your guru. Yeah, yeah. And so, so yeah, I, I'd mailed my degree to my parents. Right. I said, this is what yes, you you've done your job. Get. Yeah. And uh, that was it. You know, it was yeah. goodbye. You've done what they wanted you to do, basically, exactly, for exactly. their design. And right. still had, and you know, all, all the seekers who came in those days, they know what it's like. It was 
an intense yearning. Nothing else mattered, you know. They could have brought dancing girls and boxes of chocolate and, you know, given you billions of dollars. And this urge was just there to get enlightenment. Nothing, you know, nothing could 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 get rid of that. Of course. So you went to the follow-up meeting. When did the penny drop for you that Shrimataji, this seemingly um, you know, uh, smallish, Regularly. ordinary uh -huh. housewife type Indian lady is actually the Adi Shakti. How did when did that happen and what was it like? Well, I didn't even know she was a housewife. I thought she was like, you know one of these ladies a lady guru basically from what a lady guru about. okay yeah. yes yes and I I didn't know she was married or whatever I thought gurus... you couldn't have made out from her white yeah, yeah, I, couldn't have. Well. I just knew a lady in white said wonderful things that addressed my thoughts but nothing you know nothing in the sense of a cool breeze which I really had no yes. need of or desire for uh, had occurred uh, so I went to the follow-up, which was uh, in a place called Gower Street. And I went upstairs. It was a bit of a dingy room. And um, I heard people talking. So I walked in through an adjoining door. And uh, Marshi was sitting there on a small sofa. And a few of the people who had been on stage with her were there in the room. And... Um, she greeted me, I, this is so weird. She greeted me like I was some long lost son. Like, oh, oh you have come, you know, I, I can't even yes. try to, to describe it. And I was just drawn in like, you know, yeah. I mean, hypnotized, I guess. I was just drawn <laughs> in yeah. and she said, come, come. And everyone was sitting on the floor and she told uh, one of the guys to bring a chair for me. And they put me on a chair right in front of her so our knees were almost touching. Now, for someone wow. who always sat in the back row, this was far too close. <laughs> so, so here I am, you know, the ladies in front of me, and um, I'm on a chair, knees almost touching, and I'm totally bewildered, you know, just thrown off. Not my logical brain couldn't couldn't cope with it. And, you know, I was brought up in most Asian societies. You're very polite to your elders. Absolutely. So I couldn't, like, say, I'm leaving or run away. I just sat there quietly. And then she told this guy, and I'm laughing because yogis think it's normal. But for somebody who came from a very westernized upbringing um, and the kind of, you know, logical brain, this was total, you know, Alice in Wonderland stuff. She Absolutely. told the guy go bring some water. And I thought, water? What's that? He comes back with a basin of water and she says, put more salt in it. And I'm going, what? <laughs> Next thing I know, I have to take my socks off and plant my feet in this basin <laughs> of salt and water in front wow. of a lady whom I only saw on stage, right? So... Then she starts waving her hands on me, you know, we caught around me and at me, and you, you call it working on people now. And I'm going, mm. and then I couldn't think because it was just too much. All my circuits were fused. And um, then I saw her, but I could watch what was going on. She took a lemon. She said, bring a lemon. And she took a lemon and she broke off the part that's attached to the tree. And I'm watching. And she sticks the lemon on my forehead. And <laughs> by this time, you know, what was left of my brain was completely frizzled. And I'm just allowing her to do this. And I don't know what happened because I don't have any more memory. It's like all the thoughts were gone. Couldn't remember anything. And um, after what seemed like an eternity, I think I was released. And um, I felt a lot better you know, like a weight was taken off and all that, that, that stress that these strange things being done to me, um, you know, were sort of had subsided. And then I, I don't even remember the guy taking the water away or someone drying my feet with the towel or anything like that, because my feet were dry, but my socks were not on them. That's all I remembered. 
and uh, and um, and after that, I just left the meeting uh, and uh, went home. I don't know how long, you know, how much time transpired, really, mm -hmm. um, except that after that, I felt the urge to go to her public programs, uh, which she held twice a week on uh, Monday and Thursday in those days. Yes. And she'd come down and work on each person. So um, I started attending uh, those programs and I realized she was something uh, unique because uh, in a presence you felt, so I felt very relaxed Yes. Uh, at home and she behaved like, you know, the mother I had back in Singapore. Yes. Uh, and so it was quite easy, you know, to, to feel very much at home. And the other thing I must say is the, the, the young people who were around her, um, it's strange, I, I didn't know them. They would not have been the, the people I'd have mixed with, you know, mm -hmm. in the past. Right. Um, they still, they still uh, were dressed and looked hippie-ish. But I felt like I knew them and they felt like family. I'm talking about, you know, within a few meetings, there was something unique in that connection which mm. only got stronger and more obvious later on. Absolutely. Um, so you asked me when did I sort of know. Yeah. That took me a while. Um, about two months after going to the meetings twice a week, uh, Marcia was working on some people on stage and she, I was still not feeling this cool breeze. I just went because I liked being around her. And these new people I met felt like the seekers, you know, the, the seekers I wanted to be with, really. Well, um, and uh, she, she said to a guy next to her, uh, who she said, uh, I remember it like it was yesterday, and this was 47 years ago. Uh, she said, uh, Douglas, uh, go and work on him. And then she said in the mic, you know, nothing is secret in her. She said in the mic, Douglas is a very simple man, and he's good for intellectuals. And so Douglas comes marching down. And if you had met Douglas in those days, um, he definitely wasn't the kind of uh, appearance that you know an aerospace engineer <laughs> or an intellectual would have wanted yes. working on him, so to speak. But he came behind me. And I know he was waving his hands because I had long hair back then. And uh, I could feel him hitting my long hair, the draft. And all of a sudden, I felt a, a release in my forehead, like something just went away. And I began to feel the cool breeze. Wow. I mean, it, it was astonishing from nothing to a cool breeze in both the hands. And the other interesting thing, which made me realize this lady on the stage was more than just special, yes. was she looked up at me and said, ah, do you feel it? And then she came down from the stage, this is Mataji, and uh, she took me with her to the right-hand side of the, of the room. And she sat on a chair. I stood to her right. And then she said, put your left hand towards me and asked me to put my right hand towards uh, uh, one of the newcomers who was sitting there. And I felt uh, an amazing cool breeze coming from Marjorie. Actually, it was, it was a gale force cool wind. Wow. Uh, again, the brain just stops working. And tremendous heat from the guy coming into my right hand. So that, my, that was my first practical experience of what she talked about a couple of months area, uh, earlier, you know, feeling cool and heat. So that was another stage in realizing, okay, you know, she's definitely got these powers yes. and uh, is able to do something unique. But I'm still waiting for my realization, for my enlightenment. <laughs> Because mother kept saying, you've got your realization. Yes. Because Kundalini's come up, it's come out of Sahasrara. But um, even when I felt that cool breeze, um, I went back home and uh, I thought, all right, I'll try it from this photograph. So back then they, they gave us these photostat copies. I don't know if you, you may not be old enough to know what a photostat is. This weird machine. No, no, I know. I think it was the uh, end of thin, photostat yeah. cyclo style. Oh, okay. so this, this photograph was on a very thin piece of paper. And because it wouldn't stand up, I, I used a paper clip and clipped it to a piece of cardboard I had. 
So I, I propped it against the wall of a lamp and I put my hands and I felt a cool breeze from the photograph. So I started writing down what I felt and then the cool bees went, you know, as soon as my brain uh, yeah. got engaged. So that, you know, was, was a feeling. Amazing. Uh, that, that I had. And I just continued and I went for the follow up meetings, uh, which were held actually in, in Gavin's uh, place, which was called Brown's Geological Institute. So we'd have the follow ups upstairs. And, and I, I should tell you, um, with all today's uh, technology and so on, I still have this vivid image of mother standing on a sofa and pointing at a chart and explaining what the chakras were to us. Wow. In this little dark room. Yeah. So everything we learned was directly from mother, not from you know, charts or notes or anybody else. Every, every little thing was from her. And, and now looking back in history, I, I truly, uh, in a way, envy those that came before me because they had her for longer <laughs> with fewer <laughs> people. Yes. When I came, I think uh, I was probably the ninth or tenth person whom, whom I saw there. And I know that when mother was with us at one time, she said, uh, my first 12. Uh, so there must have been about 12 of us there then. Wow. Uh, but, uh, you know, there so many more came uh, later on. That is why it is just so important, just so you know, with time, the the absolutely unbelievable uh, form that Sri Mataji took as the Mahamaya, and and she, um, what shall we say, put us all together in this one universal family across all, uh, you know, crossing all the uh, divisions so far that human mind has created over the years, over thousands yes. of years, isn't it? It's just absolutely amazing. So the whole thing is to, to actually listen to your stories and to put it on record that, you know, Shimataji did these things because it's so unbelievable for somebody like me to think, wow, Sh you're sitting right in front of Shimataji and she's holding that lemon, vibrated lemon on you now again. It's all, oh my God, it's, it's it's absolutely unbelievable incredible yeah, yeah. so yeah. and yeah please tell us more okay just just give me a moment
Yes, yeah, so please tell us about when you realized Shrimataji for who she is. Okay, so it was um, just a little under six months after I met her. Um, I was attending all these meetings, including special follow-ups mother would do at Caxton Hall as well, not just at the private house um, where the yogis were invited. And to all these meetings, you know, when mother came on stage, all the yogis would do namaste to her and, you know, bow their heads. And mother would come sit down and do the same thing. And I, ne I never did that, I'm sorry to say. I would just be watching mother very closely to see what was going on. And on this particular day, the same thing happened. You know, everybody closed their eyes. Mother closed her eyes and and then... I was watching her, her closed eyes and uh, then she opened her eyes and looked straight at me and I was sitting near the front this time, probably in the second row. And she looked straight at me. It's almost like she looked into my eyes although we were some distance apart. And I was actually drawn into those eyes. And the experience was that I entered those eyes and whizzed back initially whisked back in time and there were galaxies floating past me and we were going closer and closer to the beginning and I can tell you one thing that happened recently which proved to me that this was not an illusion when I was in London a few years ago and the the new web telescope images uh, no, actually, I think it might have been even last year. Uh, this brand new telescope images were brought out. I think you were in London last the, year, yeah. Yeah. They, they showed one of these um, images of the galaxy. Yeah. And I had this enormous it, emotional, I don't know what, my whole being shook with recognition of having passed through that galaxy. And I remember when I came out of that amazing state later that evening, I, I, you know, I, I, I told my wife and a few yogi friends, it was just astonishing. Anyway, so took, you know, took science 40 something, 46 years to, to find it. And, you know, mother took me through it. Wow. Back in early 1978. And um, when I got to the, you know, saying God just sounds so trivial. It was such a multi-dimensional experience. You know, and forget your five senses. There were so many other so-called senses that, that are impossible to describe. And right at the beginning, you go through that. And before the beginning, there is nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the great poet Kabir yeah. has written about this. I'll, I'll forward you that poem. Yes, it is a marvelous read, especially after a good meditation. Everyone oh. should, should understand what it really means and oh, why it all of this is complete, Maya. I mean, complete. Total. I don't know why I have to be stuck in it, but it is total Maya. And before the beginning, where there was nothing, there was a presence. And that presence was the presence that occupied the body we call Mataji Nirmala Devi. Okay. And it was a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. And um, I mean, so many things happened. I can't, I can't describe it, but it, it's truly beyond description, as many people say. And po poets can get close to it, you know, like Kabir and so on, uh, but it's hard. And, um, you know, that recognition is just, uh, oh, I see something is flashing. <laughs> yes. I was just reminded of the Devi Mahatmya, where the description of the goddess and all her fierce forms that she takes to destroy those um, asuras and rakshasas and how Shrimatji just, you know, appeared so approachable we weren't scared of her I mean if, if she were not to be the form that she was 
I yeah, don't yeah. think we would, would have been be. anywhere near. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But no. Maybe we should stop the recording. I'll have to see what this flashing is. Okay. Yeah, so. So after that, after that moment where this presence was in the middle of the nothingness, I stayed in this state for yeah. three days and three nights. And um, all I know is, I remember this happened in Caxton Hall, which is in London. And I was living in uh, Birmingham, England at the time. And um, on the third day, I, I heard, heard Marshaji's voice saying, you're useless to me like this. And uh, I slowly began to come away from, you know, come back to some sort of awareness of the brain where this message came. And then over a period of hours, it felt like, if not longer, uh, became aware of the body. And then I realized I was back in Birmingham uh, and three days had gone by since I had this experience in, in Caxton Hall. Oh. I didn't eat, drink, sleep, nothing. And I was completely, I have no idea how I got back. I mean, it's just totally, you know, mind boggling. So somehow, I mean, I don't even want to think about that right now, but people can, you know, think of the possibilities. So it was very difficult to, to, to come out of this state. And um, then it was like some kind of explanation. And, you know, many people, including some of the old yogis will tell you, you know, mother talks to you through Sahasrara yeah. and tells you things. And all I, I recall is, you know, being told that I needed to, to, to spread her teachings and sitting in that blissful state uh, would not help. And that I had to be in the world, off the world, which, you know, mother has in the early days sort of spoken about. And... Um, at that time, you know, I had no reaction to it. But now, after coming to America for a few years and looking back, I feel it was so unfair because I had got the enlightenment. Yes. You know, going beyond body, mind, emotions, everything, and, and going to a really deep state. Absolutely. And it had been taken away from me by the person who had triggered it off. Fair enough. But... <laughs> You know, but at that time, you, you were just a good little boy listening to mummy. Yes. And um, so I, I ventured out of the house and I can tell you, or my flat, everything looked so beautiful. Everything was so alive. And, and it's like you're walking in slow motion and your movement is creating ripples that you know Mm. is going throughout the universe and I you know you're technically minded as well in the back there and so I moved my little finger and I could see not even see it's like you just know it's Sensor. not a visual thing yeah. you just know it's happening yeah. and everywhere I gaze it was just it's completely indescribable and there was this infinite love you know I only used to love uh um, babies and animals, you know. I mean, and of course, your family and your parents. Yeah. But this was, uh, this was, it just flowed everywhere, not just to animate objects, but yeah. to the stones, to the rocks, to everything. Yeah. And the joy, it's like yeah. I couldn't contain it. it. It was going to rip apart my body. Really? Like this wow. intense joy, just like bursting everywhere. All and like you, you are the sphere just radiating this continuous thing. 
And it's good I was in England because I'd have been fired from my job because I hadn't been to work. <laughs> and I didn't have a telephone at home, by the way. In those days, you needed a phone. Yes. And I'm yeah, talking yeah. about the 1970s when not all of us had a phone at home. So, so all in all, it, 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 it was amazing. So e eventually, um, I knew I had to go back to work. But I, I, my desire was to go see mother um, at, at one of her follow-up meetings in London. So I was able to drive, although I can tell you it's, it's a very strange experience where this consciousness is watching Bala sitting in his little car driving to London. It's a very strange uh, state yes. to be in. I was at that time. Now, you know, most yogis, hopefully after a good meditation, a deep meditation, are in that witness state. And um, I, I went and sat down right in the front this time, you know, like, I got to be near her wow. and um, mother came on stage and as she walked up, she saw me. In fact, I still remember she came in from uh, the left side of the stage as I'm facing the stage, it was the left. And she started walking up and then she turned and looked at me and she said, Bala had a very special experience and she gave this super sweet smile at me and went and sat down and did the program. And then at after the program, we all walk up to the car and she wound down her window and called me towards her and she said, come to my house. And I have to say after that, I was staying at a house from Friday night after work till Saturday night when I had to go back to Birmingham wow. <laughs> every weekend. <laughs> and uh, okay. you know, everything I was taught, everything... Yeah. she explained was in a house during those uh, amazing times so that that state of being is something that <clears throat> hopefully uh sad yogis will achieve one day and we'll live in that state um but before we reach there that that's the goal was that the goal that 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 we that you aspire for even now or um, I think a, a little bit, um, two questions. So first of all, great experience. And then being with mother from on the weekend, still the public program. And then you're going back to your normal everyday life. How did you sort of balance the two? Or did it automatically happen as it does sometimes when we're really sort of there? Okay, so the question I asked I said to mother was, I would like to follow you around. Uh, and, you know, work to me was absolutely irrelevant. Everything else was irrelevant. And she refused, you know, very sweetly, of course. She said, no, no, you have to work. You have to look like an ordinary person. I mean, I look like an ordinary person, but it was, you know, it was very difficult. She basically told me, go back to your job during the week. And um, I would go back to the job and I would have this, uh, my, actually my co-workers told me I would have this silly smile on my face all the time. <laughs> it was a complete illusion. And like I said, I was watching Bala wandering around and I couldn't get involved in anything. And I was supposed to be a quality engineer in an electronics uh, manufacturing facility. It was Lucas Electronics up north in a place called Four Oaks in Birmingham. Uh -huh. And my job was to make sure that if anything went wrong, you know, we looked at which process it was, whether it was where the, the wafers came in or in the diffusion process or, you know, things of that nature. And um, I still remember my boss came in and said, the line is down, the line is down, you know, everything stopped. And obviously I was smiling. And he said, it's, it's not a laughing matter. I wasn't laughing. I was just smiling. He says, it's not a laughing matter. This is serious. I, and I said, uh, it's okay. I'll go and sort it out. I, I just vaguely you know, remember saying that. And somehow in those days, things would get sorted out. I mean, you're doing things. But I can tell you that after coming to America, it's been very difficult. So I know what yogis um, go through when you have a job. Uh, it somehow seems easier in England, especially 
after that experience and being constantly um, recharged uh, mm. by mother, by Sri Masjid. Uh, but in America, uh, it's it's got mo much, much more difficult. Uh, yeah, and, I suppose. Yeah. Uh, very, very, it's it's a different psyche there. And so therefore the atmosphere is completely, uh, not yes. completely, but different, quite different, yes. isn't it? So if I may ask, what was your first puja experience um, with Sri Mataji? Um, and where was it? Okay, so the first puja was in London. I don't remember the exact location. It might have been in the house where we have follow-ups. Um, so it would be Ashley Gardens or... Um, uh, no, Mother didn't do uh, pujas in a house, not that I recall. No, because it Church was, Road uh, probably uh, then. Yeah, yeah, because the the servant was there and, you know, people popped in, uh, non-yogis would have popped in, so it would have been in either there or the, the, what we call the Temple of All Faiths. Uh, yes. But I knew it was a room because it, it couldn't have been the Temple of All Faiths because it was a room and there was a table there. And um, by the way, I'd never done puja in, <clears throat> in my life. Right. And um, my, um, you know, my parents didn't do such things either. So um, at least not in the house. I don't know if they did it in a temple or in a church or whatever. Yes. Yes. And, uh, so I saw people uh, going up and, uh, you know, doing something on a feet because the feet were blocked. I was sitting on the floor this time, not on a chair. So I slipped behind a table. There was a table there. And I slipped behind this table, which was on the right hand side of the room. And I remember it clearly because it was a very traumatic experience for me. Mm. Um, I... Um, Oh, by the way, this hap this puja was before I um, I had this experience. This puja so, is before the experience. Was before Interesting. I the experience. Okay. I, I just thought it was one of those regular follow up meetings. Yeah. So next thing I know, she, mother finishes talking and then she's calling people up. And she says, "Oh, you can come wash my feet." And I thought, "What?" You know. So I slipped behind this table, like wash my feet. <laughs> you know, I was, I had this. Hindu Christian upbringing. I went to a yeah. Methodist school all my life. You know, kindergarten was St. Paul's Church School. Yeah. My parents had told me you never touch a human's feet, you know? I yeah. mean, yeah. Period. And even though they had Hindu background as, as well as went to the same, you know, Christian brainwashing schools. Um, so not that I there's anything wrong with Christianity. I mm. I enjoyed every moment in my school. Yes. Um, so um, I sat there and then, so all these uh, yogis, when I say all, you know, maybe five or, or six, were going forward one at a time and they spent an awfully long time washing those feet. And suddenly I hear mother's voice saying, Bala, Bala, come. And I'm thinking, how come she, know, she can see me behind this table? And she says, Bala, come. And I thought, no, I can't, I can't. <laughs> and my head was swimming. And she says, come, come. And then all these yogis are, you know, turning and looking at me. And then I, I you know, it's, it's the, the thing was, this is an older person telling me to come. Absolutely. You know, that, 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 that Asian you have to obey. upbringing, right? It's like, yeah. you have to obey. You, have, you, have not, you can't look rude, basically. Yes. And you know, very nice feelings in front of her. So I'm dragging myself very slowly forward not even standing, shuffling on the ground. And in my brain, I'm thinking, all right, four or five people have washed the feet. They're definitely clean now. So I don't <laughs> mind touching them, you know, on a hygienic basis. And so I go up there and someone is pouring water and I have to, you know, wash the feet. And I remember thinking, wow, these feet are tiny. You know? And then I'm rubbing them and they are quite cool. And then she says, rub here, rub there. And um, after that, you know, I'm allowed to go back and someone, I guess, starts drying Marshi's feet. And I go back behind the table. And then I feel completely relaxed. 
But my brain is thinking, is that because the ordeal is over? You know, because the ordeal is over, I'm relaxed. I'm feeling great now because that anxiety, she's going to call me, is over. But I did feel better when I went home you know, later on. So I guess that that was the first puja. And, um, you know, although it wasn't, and just to let you know, you know, there weren't all these mantras being chan chanted and whatnot. But I can tell you about the early pujas after my realization. Um, they used to be held in the Temple of All Faiths. Mm -hmm. So we had to be there at 9 a.m. And uh, it was a cement, a concrete floor. No mats, none of that comfort. We sat there and mother told us, when you come for a puja, you sit in your position. And only if you come up to wash the feet, do you leave that position. Sometimes those pujas would go on till five. I don't mean the puja went on. We sat in meditation afterwards for a long time. Yeah. So in those days, um, mother used to ask me, and I don't know if the old yogis remember this, uh, by the way, I never told any of the old yogis about that tremendous experience I had. It right. seems so personal and private. Yes. Uh, and I only spoke to mother about it. And, um, you know, she basically said, you got your enlightenment. That's it, but yes. It because enlightenment is that state where the world, you know, is the Maya. You've gone beyond that Maya. Yeah. And you see reality for what it is, which is... Again, read Kabir, nothingness. Yes. And all this is a projection of the great illusionist whom we call Mahamaya. Yeah. And it's just as painful. And if anyone wants to get an inkling of it, watch The Matrix, the first one. Oh, yes. And see what it is. This is just simply yeah. an infinitely sized equivalent, equivalent computer yeah. giving us this total fake but at times very painful <laughs> experience on yeah. this planet and okay. and you know it brings happiness and so on which yeah. are nothing compared to to spiritual joy so at this puja there'd be two of us uh one of the first yogis and myself who would uh you know do the decorating and so on so i used to put mother's uh you know earrings on or a necklace and uh you know, comb my hair and uh, put wow. on my feet on occasions. And then later on, some of the ladies will also uh, come and do that. So we were, we were very close. And uh, when you talk about sitting in front of mother, you know, knee to knee on a chair, later on, I, I used to stay in a house, stay in a room and, uh, you know, I mean, it was a very, very close relationship. Yes. Uh, that, I mean, that, we can only dream of such close proximity. It's so good to hear of it. And, and it's, a, it's, it's a connection that I've learned in subsequent years is only safe if you're in that state. Yes. If you are not in that state, uh, you make mistakes, and then the consequences are quite serious. So if you're not in that state, it's best to stay at a distance. And many yogis have learned this. Yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of it is us practicing daily. And it depends on one's intensity. And those of us who came in the early days, like I said, we only wanted that. And we would do anything, you know, give up friends, family, yes. everything. Yes. Uh, for that. that is and those who have come later, I have seen over the four and a half plus decades, uh, they have difficulty doing that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I fully understand that. And uh, then they will ask me, why haven't we had these, you know, great experiences that you and some of the early yogis have? And I don't know how to say it politely. I just say, you know, you, you, ha you have to have that desire as the one all consuming yeah. and nothing else matters. And it gets difficult, I know. I mean, um, I used to think, why don't these people jump into it? And mother made sure I understood why. 
by firstly getting me married. So there's another person, although a yogi, a good yogini. Uh, and then when you have children, yes. you realize all these ties. I remember telling mother, I don't want to get married because yogis do not get married. And she'd say, stop being an ascetic. Stop being an ascetic. You're a saji yogi. Yes. And it really was a maya within a maya because when you get yes. married and you have kids, you have all these very strong ties Absolutely. which um, do get in the way. So I, I, after 47 years, can tell yogis who feel uh, discouraged, don't be because it's extremely difficult to lead a life with you know, a family that Master G has put you in and children yeah. she has caused to be born to you. Yes. Um, you know, realized souls, of course, being born and all those attachments and still pursue the meditation fully because you're trying to also provide uh, for your family. Yeah. So you can't just say, I'm giving up this job which has got bad vibrations. <laughs> 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 and you just have the family starving on the streets while I go into a meditative bliss. Because it's not she's possible, you can't some, meditate. Uh, yeah, she's given us some material responsibilities. Sure. And I think Shumat, not I think, Shumatji wanted uh, Sajyogis or wants Sajyogis to be, um, you know, role models, basically. Yes, in the world or, and off the world. Yeah. So I think the best we can do, I mean, I, I should just speak for myself. I'm sure there are yogis who have, you know, evolved far to, to far better states than me. But I think from my side, as long as you're behaving as a, as a good person, a dharmic person, That's it. Um, and uh, going into those meditative states, still feeling vibrations, avoiding, you know, negative vibe things and having that blissful state with the divine at least once a day, if not more often, and you know, taking care of uh, those you're responsible for, it's yeah. not too bad. But it is nice to to go off into those states, and occasionally, when you go off into the the forest or a quiet place in the park, you can yeah. you can enjoy that. You can enjoy that for hours. Yeah. Yes. Um I had a question, uh, which was, and it's totally gone now. So what, oh yeah. So do you still manage to get up at 4 a.m., do your shoe beat meditation? Uh, and and will you tell us please about how the Ashram of the North came about? And because Shimatsuji uh, actually gave you written instructions, didn't she, about what you need to do, am oh, I yeah. right? Yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah. So would you please yeah. tell us about that? Right, right. So um, in, I think it was 1980 or so, uh, I was working at Rolls-Royce Aircraft Engines in Derby. And uh, actually, no, prior to that, when I was in, um, in Birmingham, mother said, you know, to me, buy, buy a house with a large living room so you can have meditation programs in there. So with my meager British income, I, I bought a place out in Tamworth which is all I could afford then, and uh, used to have uh, programs in my house. And uh, prior to that, I was having programs in, in Birmingham, England as well, which I started, actually after that peak experience, I felt everyone's got to you know, have this fantastic experience. So I put an ad out, same like mother's ad, uh, pretty much identical, and uh, had people coming to my house uh, to meditate. And uh, sad to say, every one of them who had a strong experience uh, went straight down to London and decided to live there because mother was there. Um, and for yogis who, you know, feel that, um, you know, you have to do a lot of decorating and so on, I have to tell you, I had that photostat copy clipped to a piece of cardboard leaning against a wall on an old brown table in an old flat, which was the only one I could afford. And I had seven chairs laid out and I had seven people sitting there and I didn't say a thing to them. They answered the ad, they came in. I said, please take a seat. I had Marjorie's picture there, a little candle in front of it. 
at that time, I didn't even know about putting bandans uh, with the candle on the photograph. The candle was just there. I said, sit down, put your hands out, sit upright. Went behind them, worked like Mother had taught me. And through her grace, every one of them, and it's not just the cool breeze, they went into thoughtless awareness. And one elderly man had such a powerful experience he stood up, pushed his chair back, and prostrated on the ground. And again, I had never done that before, Mother, at that, uh, up to that time. And this Englishman said to me, where is she? Where is she? I have to go to her. And he stuck his right hand into his pocket and pulled out a wad of 10 and 20 pound notes to give me money. And of course, like mother, I just laughed. And I said, you can't pay for it. And he shot off down to, to London. And you know, when mother met him, she, she told us later that he was an ancient seeker who had damaged himself by going to India over, a, you know, for I think a year or more. And had tried so many gurus. She made him write down uh, their names and he had filled two full scrap sheets with the names of every guru he'd been to. So, so we had, we had some, some amazing times. So the, the point I was trying to make is, if you want to work on somebody, you know, you don't have to have a big altar. You don't need a permanent meditation room. Look, look at where the yogis meet on Saturdays in London. You know, you just rent a place. It's the vibrations of the yogis and their devotion in London that creates the vibrations. They are, there are people, particularly in America, who are of the illusion that you have to build vibrations in a permanent place that is owned by us. And I, I don't say that is wrong, but you can have public meetings anywhere, anytime. I had a guy in the, in the library park who was interested, and yeah. he got it. And the yogis here who, are, who, who hold meetings in the park, American yogis and yoginis, yeah. who are giving, you know, raising kundalinis of hundreds of people. So for the few who think it's, you need a special location, no. And for the many who are already doing it all over the world, it yeah. works. It it's works. the living process and it is not bound it by uh, boundaries. Exactly, and that power is everywhere. I mean, yeah. you, you hear of old yogis who give, who decades ago gave realization in schools in Algeria and other countries, you know. So it's, it's there, you just have to be willing to, uh, to, to allow it to flow through you. Yeah, and it's like my father used to say, it's the power of the Param Chaitanya that Shrimatji said, it's all pervading, all permeating. And we just yeah. we just tap into it, being Sahaja Yogis, and just, it is, I would, duty probably or not, but it is, you know, we have that blessing from Shrimatji to yeah. share it with the rest of uh, humanity and the universe. Exactly, uh, exactly. So getting back to Darby Ashram. So in 1978, uh, we thought that the Tamworth house that I was, that I had was, uh, you know, mother came there a couple of times, I think. And we had the first Krishna Puja there as well, which was really nice. Uh, and, uh, but then I, I got the job at Rolls Royce. So I felt I had to move to Darby, Rolls Royce was in Derby. And so mother said um, uh, to buy an ashram. So I was able to buy this five bedroom house mm -hmm. uh, with um, two and a half baths, which is unusual in England. You know, usually you have 10, uh, 10 bedrooms and one bathroom. <laughs> I'm joking. Yeah. But this was a very old house built in the 1800s. Uh, whoever owned it had added some stuff. And um, so she told me, you got to make it into a Paka Ashram. Wow. And she gave me all the instructions for the discipline. And then she had the, uh, the Indian leader or coordinator, whose name was Rajabai Modi. I think he was the first uh, coordinator there uh, to type up the puja instructions. And so I got those. And um, we used to do a full puja every morning. So uh, we had to get up at 4 a.m. Uh, we went uh, out and shoe beat. We, um, uh, of course, we had to, you know, 
I don't have to tell you that you have to do your morning ablutions, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then you go out and shoo me. Yeah. And then uh, we came back uh, to the meditation room and had a full puja. Now, when I say full puja, in those days, we did not have the elements. And even the pujas we did with mother in the early days, uh, there were no elements. Uh, it was just water. And they worked just as well. And we had fantastic, fantastic vibrations afterwards. So um, we did that. And then after that, we, we sat in uh, silent meditation, which would have lasted for hours if we didn't set little buzzers uh, to stop and go off to work. It was that, it was that marvelous. I mean, the, the blessings of the divine grace was, yeah. was supreme. And every one of us who lived in the ashram would go up and wash, uh, wash the feet. Wow. Uh, so it was, it was collective. And also in the ashram, uh, we had equality uh, for those few people from certain parts of the subcontinent mm -hmm. who think that only women should be cooking and looking after things, everyone had a responsibility oh, good. Uh, back in 1980. And uh, we all took turns cooking. Nice. Uh, we all took turns washing up the mess we left in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, so we, we did, uh, you know, we shared. It was, it was, it was marvelous. And it was really like a family. And um, I don't know how to describe it, but everyone who lived there was in this state of uh, what we call doubtless awareness. Yeah. It's just a marvelous state to be in. And uh, I might have mentioned it before, but there were, I mean, we were all young. We were in our 20s. Okay. There was some, there was a guy younger than I was uh, called Sean, who used to, who came back after his, first day at work, uh, he worked in uh, uh, a different kind of uh, job. And he said that uh, he watched himself. He said, I saw, I could see Sean walking inside and uh, going about his job. And that's how all of us were. You, yeah. you would watch this bala wandering around. And, and now that's not the case. I mean, if I go, when I went to work um, in research and design here, I wasn't watching Bala after a few years in America. Bala was Bala, <laughs> thinking hard about how do I stop the plane from falling out of the sky wow. when someone's flying in it. But at that time, of course, it, it, it was just a completely different state. Now, I cannot categorically state that you do not have to use your conscious yeah. uh, designing brain to make sure you really design an aircraft or an aircraft engine that is going to work correctly. I really cannot say whether that can be done in a state of doubt, doubtless awareness. So please, if any of you are doing important work of that nature, continue doing it safely. That's just a safety message. <laughs> It'll work For out even better, one would, uh, uh, one would, uh, realize probably tell us about your most profound uh, miracle experience please uh, i mean the experience you said about the, the 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 universe the galaxies amazing amazing but on a on a on a tangible human level what on a was human it? level miracles okay um uh, i can't call them miracles because i know who occupied or what occupied Sri Mashti's body. So we'll talk about Sri Mashti like yes. the body is part of that entity. Yes. Um, when it's actually the reverse, the entity is occupying that body or part of it is, um, was attending a cancer patient who happened to be the wife of mother's former medical professor. Uh, they were in London and she had a uh, terminal cancer, you know, they couldn't cure, so the professor had come and asked mother. So Mashi had sent uh, yogis to work on her, and um, I didn't know about it till mother told me, and it was during one of those periods when I was staying in mother's house, and she said, oh, I I'm going to see this lady, come with me. So I went with mother, and uh, as yogis know, you know, mother asks you to work on a lady, which is a joke. And um, so she worked on this woman as well, of course, throughout. And um, we found out later 
from the husband that she had a spontaneous remission. So she got cured. And wow. um, Mashi had told her that you have to practice Saja Yoga, you have to meditate to keep the cure, to maintain the cure. Yeah. I don't know, you know, the, what happened after that. So like that, they were, they were cures. There was another lady who was on a deathbed in the hospital and um, mother asked someone to, no, actually her family was pleading with mother to come cure her. And mother said, oh, uh, to one of the yogis to just give a, one of those, they had these really tiny black and white photos uh, to just put it under a pillow. And lo and behold, she was cured back to normal. Um, so those were some of the things. Uh, one of the things that occurred um, with, uh, through me was in Birmingham uh, where I was having these meetings and there was a lady and, and our meetings were purely about meditation. There was nothing about curing. There was nothing about relaxation, nothing about stress reduction back then in the 70s and early 80s. So um, this lady wanted to meditate and she was brought in on a wheelchair by a husband who was not interested in meditation. Um, so again, this was England during the days when it was all English people. Uh, we didn't have people from other communities coming. And I remember mother used to comment that all the seekers are English and uh, the people who come from Asia just seem, and I'm talking about the 70s, things have changed a lot. So not meant to offend any communities. Um, she said all the others have just come here to make money or to succeed in life, uh, whereas the English have been, you know, seeking for a long time. So this lady was brought in and um, uh, the husband would pick her up and put her on a chair. And then he'd come back later when the meeting was over to pick her up. So I, I was in mother, uh, at mother's house the following weekend. And I just told mother about this woman and the husband had said she had multiple sclerosis, uh, which I'd never heard of before as well. I learned all many diseases in Sahaj actually about them. And I also learned about fake gurus in Sahaj. I didn't know about yeah. any of them except the TM guy. Yeah. Um, so um, mother told me what to do. So I, the following meeting, uh, when the husband brought the woman, I didn't want people to see any weird things going on. So I told the husband, put her at the back of the room. So we got a chair at the back and he placed her there. And you know, I, I started the meeting and while well, people were sitting meditating, uh, we didn't have, I, I, you know, didn't play a talk either then. Unless really? you had a tape recorder. I'm talking about, you know, 1978. Yes. yes. When I was doing yeah. them in Birmingham. So um, I stood behind this woman and I worked on her as mother had instructed. And I felt things clearing up because by then I was feeling vibrations. I had all the experience and so on. Yeah. So I thought, I thought, oh, I'll ask her, can you stand? So she kind of got up gingerly and her legs were trembling, but she stood and she was really excited. So I said, see if you can walk around the chair. And she held the chair and she walked around it. I mean, a bit wobbly. Now you have to remember England, I mean, you live in England, so you know, but unlike America, England had a wonderful healthcare system. Yes. And so she had therapists who came and helped to keep her muscles reasonably supple or her husband took her, took her there, but they weren't strong because she didn't walk. Um, so, it worked. So the husband came back. So after the meeting, so then she sat to meditate and you know, I had to run the meeting. So I couldn't be spending more time with her. And then when the husband came uh, after the meeting and um, I went back there and uh, to the back of the room and uh, I said to her, try and stand. So she stood up and then her husband was, I mean, he looked completely amazed and um, she wanted to walk, he brought the wheelchair. So she held his arm and, you know, hobbled out of the room. Wow. So there was this cure of multiple sclerosis for a woman who was crippled, who was in a wheelchair. Amazing. You know, so that was pretty remarkable. I have to tell you though, because of the state we were in at that time, yeah. I didn't think it was remarkable. I just thought, well, mother told me to do this. 
I did it and it worked. Wow, and Joshua because, wanted you again and again for me, yeah, actually. She, yeah. I mean, when after that recognition or that experience that lasted several days, I knew this, this energy. Yes. And I, I don't even believe, I mean, yogis will probably tell me off. I don't believe all of the energy was occupying the body. I think only a fraction of it. The rest of it was maneuvering the entire universe. And that fraction to us was like infinity. And it could handle everything and anything yes. if it so desired. Yes. And there, you know. Yeah, yeah, the beauty of it uh, and, and the issue, enormity. It, yeah, you see, you see norm, normal illnesses that don't go cured, and here's something phenomenal yeah. by some yogi hanging around in Birmingham waving his hands as yeah. instructed, and the lady starts walking. Wow. And, really? Uh, you know, we've had uh, cancer cures as well. Yes. Uh, we've. Uh, where they say, oh, you know, so-and-so had a... We had have, a um, oh, you might probably know her, Kay, uh, Kay in our collective, and, and Mother Shumatsuji cured her cancer as well. Oh, um, wow. Kay right. O'Connell. Right. So you have first uh, someone yeah. whom it, it happened yeah. to. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, it's just so, amazing. So, yeah, the thing is that she, you know, the entity, Matsuji. Yeah. She, our, our spiritual teacher and guru, uh, she knows everything. And yet at times you see that the human aspect doesn't see certain or doesn't appear to see certain things that are occurring there that the rest of us see and wonder yeah. why it's not addressed. Yeah. Um, and some of the things that that are spiritual in nature. Uh, I'll tell you one time uh, we were a small group. Uh, we were doing a tour. This was a time mother just called me and said, come down. So this, this was when I was given permission to leave the job and just dash down to the South. She said, we're right. gonna do a tour of, of uh, the South of England. Right. So I went down and I think, I forget, I think we were somewhere near Hatfield and uh -huh. um, we were in a room with mother. She was sitting on the bed and she was talking to the leader and a, a few of the yogis were sitting next to him. And I was behind mother leaning against a wall, just taking vibrations because I wasn't involved in the conversation. I didn't want to sit in front. So I sat behind her and she was sitting on the uh, bed, her back to me, talking to the leader and uh, the other yogis were in front. And suddenly I went into that state that I had during that peak experience. Where I went, I mean, it, it's hard to describe. And then I slowly opened my eyes and I saw Marjorie on the bed turn around and go like this towards me. She did namaste to me. Wow. I mean, probably 180 degrees, she turned around. And at that moment, I. It was she knew that I knew what was what yeah. was within that body. Absolutely. And it was only Gavin who was talking to her later who said, Why did Sri Mataji turn around and <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> nobody else commented, funnily. But um, he asked me later, and he used to, he had a bit of an issue with it. He'd keep calling me teacher's pet, you know. No, it's really, how's yeah. teachers say, I'm not. I said she, she really talks highly of you, which she did. She'd always say, "Oh, you know, he's here for this," and and all the old yogis were, you know, wonderful, yes. wonderful. Absolutely, wonderful. very special uh, people. I, I must, yeah. one must say, it's a privilege talking to, um, to you and to the yogis who have spent so much time with Shramataji. It seems, uh, it's palpably. Uh, like you guys are from a different bottle, if one can put it that way. Yeah. It is just amazing and very beautiful. In to conclude, would you please share with us some, um, you know, those times when you spent with Shramataji? What other kind of um, wisdom is probably not an adequate word? Things that you'd like to share with the collective, please. 
Okay, the first thing I would say is, and um, I'm only saying this because mother asked me uh, in the early 80s, teach them how to meditate. And uh, another comment she made often was she said, uh, uh, they really don't have Shraddha. You know, and Shraddha is a word I never knew before because I said I did not know uh, Sanskrit, Hindi, or Marathi, or whatever. Uh, but it is like this, this surrendering, very emotional, deeply, you know, giving everything. I mean, you probably know the real devotion. Devotion. Totally. Um, and uh, but the meditation, I can see because a lot of yogis are devoted. There's no question about it. I, I see that. You know, I have to throw in a little bit here. Uh, you hear about, you know, division in groups and so on. But I see uh, the so-called two groups as just two centers, two Saji Yoga centers, approaching it in different ways. And each center is looked after or coordinated by people who are devoted to Sri Mahasaji. I don't see any reduced devotion in any of them, whether it's the, the meeting place I go to or not. You know, they're all yes. devoted. So the thing she, she talked about the meditation and the meditation is beyond what I, I, I can't think of a better term to use than rituals. And it's not meant to be, uh, um, you know, derogatory because rituals have their place. But if you want to go into meditation, you you don't you can't be doing things. So things like working on your chakras, clearing up, and so on, they prepare you to enter meditation. And I think there there are definitely there must be talks in which Mother says, in the morning meditation, you don't do those things. You can of course put on bandans if you are in a dangerous neighborhood. <laughs> even if that may be a room in your house. And um, you can raise your kundalini because that feels good probably. Um, and then you just want to focus, if you have to focus on something, on sasrara, or if you have thoughts, you look at mother's agya chakra, or you look at the middle of her right hand. Uh, that's if you have to. But try and make the mornings where you go into that silence. And the other thing that many yogis have forgotten, and I'm talking about the newer ones, is that a puja is a place not where we want to demonstrate our singing and musical capabilities, but where we want to go deeper, where we want to pro be propelled into that marvelous state of meditation where you feel the joy of the spirit bubbling through. And even though you're trying to look serious on camera, it, it just makes you want to smile. And you have to be prepared for that. So after the puja, please remain silent. As the old yogis might testify, in the old days, mother said after a puja, and we sat silently for hours, us talking about the puja sitting on the cement, we would sit quietly for hours in meditation till mother told us she had to leave. Um, so after the puja, don't feel you have to strum your guitar or your mandolin or whatever. Don't feel you have to sing and show how devoted you are. The devotion is within. Listen to the talks where Mother says, when you are in meditation, you are one with me. And the time when she says, when you're in the silence, you are with me. Remember that. Remember that. Allow yourself an hour of silence afterwards. Please. It's fun to chit-chat, but we have chit-chatted for lifetimes with friends and family. If we can all rise, and we all have to rise together, because there have been times, and it might be recorded, where mother said, Saji Yoga is like a plate, 
and she demonstrated. And when I raise the plate, I have to raise everyone with me, unless some roll and fall off the plate. So it's like an elastic band. We can have some yogis, and all over the world we have yogis like that, who try and move, who move forward with mother's grace and with their dedication and discipline, but the elastic band of the collective pulls you back. And sometimes if you aren't careful, you find out the way an elastic band works is you are behind the collective. <laughs> so it's in all our interest to encourage our fellow yogis to go into that silence. And that's what we had in Derby. We had the silence after this puja. And we did that again in the evenings. You sat silently and meditated. And at midday, if you could, if you had an office with a door that could close, and anytime, anywhere, just go into the silence. And um, that's where we find her. That's where we feel her. And that's where, you know, you will enter that state wow. that Kabir beautifully describes. The poem is called Abode of the Beloved. Look forward to that. Please do uh, email it to us. That would be lovely. Um, thank you so much, Uncle Bala, for talking so to much. us uh, from the US of A for taking the time out. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Jai Shri Mataji. Bye-bye.